good afternoon everyone or morning uh evening whatever time of day it is for you uh welcome uh to london from london where it's pouring with rain i know that surprises you or not uh but thank you um and this is the third webinar i've been running since we've uh, been in these strange covid times uh the first one was about covid and the macro economy and what's the impact going to be the second was around covid and aging and a longevity agenda but today i think it's time to move away from COVID. We're going to look at some long run trends. Uh, and now there's plenty of those to think about how they're going to change our world. Uh, obviously, issues to do with the sustainability and the green economy. Uh, the shift we're seeing, I think, away from a focus on economics to politics, uh, a raft of long term trends. But the two I want to focus on are technology and longevity. Uh, and I think those two very much interact in a way that's going to have a profound effect on jobs and careers. Uh, they're also, and of course not by coincidence, the two trends I focus on in the, my new book uh, with Linda Grattan, The New Long Life, uh, which came out in the UK at the end of May and will be coming out across uh, different countries in different translations throughout the rest of 2020. And really, you know, I'm going to focus on a particular aspect of these two trends, but let me just sort of say a little bit about how I, I, I see the, the book and kind of why I write it. So much of uh, our work and our lives today is still a product of what was achieved during the Industrial Revolution. And that's causing a problem because those systems are either a personal or social level are coming under stress. And that's kind of profound implications of what we mean by work. So what do I mean by things being shaped by the Industrial Revolution? Well, the Industrial Revolution really separated out work from home. It created a place of work and then a place of home. And that, of course, immediately creates issues of work-life balance in a way that didn't really have the same meaning before. And the sense of a factory and the sense of a home then also led to a creation of work time and leisure time as being two very, very distinct things. It also uh, led, because of that separation of work and home, to a big change in gender roles as well, in terms of home and raising a family and working. Um, it also led to a, a new way of thinking about time. It led to the creation of the weekend and, of course, the creation of retirement. And then we also saw with the Industrial Revolution the expansion of schooling uh, to 12, 14, 16 and now 18. And that also helped create the concept of teenagers as sort of young adults without responsibilities. Uh, so it really shapes a lot of what we thought about as jobs and also careers. And it created that three stage life that seemed to support a 70 year life expectancy. And what I want to sort of say is we kind of spent a long time socially trying to work out what to make of the Industrial Revolution. And in particular, how to make it work for us as humans and as a society. So there's a long process of trying to work out actually how do we make the use of this new technology, but still function as families and homes. So um, uh, uh, that, that's um, uh, what I'm going to try and focus on today. How does AI and robotics change our world? And how does longevity change our world? And what's going to be, how do we rewire our working careers? Uh, so uh, let me uh, kick off. Um, uh, so here's what we're going to try and do. We're going to start with looking at technological progress and employment. And let me just begin by just talking about that phrase technological progress, because isn't it a glorious word? What we should be really thinking about is technological achievement, because technological achievements don't really lead to progress from a social point of view until we as individuals and society say, yeah, this is how we want to use it. And that's a theme I really want to try and stress today because technology is not destiny, demography is not destiny. We can shape this and it's really important that we shape technology in the way that works for us. And in particular, we can't have technology just being driven by AI firms or firms in general. We're gonna to to make sure that it works for us. Going back to the Industrial Revolution, what you saw with the Industrial Revolution was sort of a first half where you got economic growth, but a lot of social stress. And in particular, workers didn't get a lot of the benefit. Then you saw a lot of social changes that then did support uh, a broader social gains. And what we're gonna make sure this time around is we don't do it in two halves. We, we make a start in a way that's good for the broader social agenda. But now I'm gonna begin by looking at how technological progress is gonna affect the labor market, 
uh, and both the number of jobs and the type of jobs. And I'll go through some of the macroeconomic literature on that, both the traditional and uh, more modern stuff. Then I'm going to talk about longevity because I, you know, technology and longevity interact in a very particular way. Longevity, you'll have heard me talk about before with the hundred year life, but the new long life goes deeper into many of those issues. And that putting those two together will give us a framework for what's going to happen over careers. And then we can boil down to what it means at the individual level. How does this shape your attitude towards your career and the type of jobs that you'll be doing? And finally, we then switch to thinking about, well, there's plenty of things that you can do to prepare yourself for this future, but actually we need a lot of help too from governments, from educational institutions, as well as from corporates. And you know, let me just go back to what I think is gonna happen over the next few decades. We're gonna get a fundamental rewiring of how we work and how we live. And that's gonna come about as we adapt to the gains in longevity achieved, let alone what may happen further along, but also as we adjust to a new labor market driven by AI and robotics. Now, uh, I say that the book, New Long Life, really has as its starting point, if machines are becoming more machine-like, how do we seize the benefits as humans and become more human-like? And that'll be a theme that I'll pick up on here uh, today, but really I'm focusing on careers and, and jobs. Um, before I begin though, it's always good to get a bit of interaction because I want to kind of get your feeling on these topics. I spend a lot of time talking to companies and students around the world and it's interesting how people's attitude, particularly around technology, varies. So uh, Laura, could you uh, just load the first poll because I want to try and get your sense of how you feel both individually and at a social level and you can, you can uh, check more than one of the answers here. Uh, so. Uh, I, so are you worried about AI and robotics for your own job? The second one, sorry, says mass, uh, mass unemployment. There's a, a phrase missing there. The third one is, uh, I, I'm not worried. I don't think my job's going to be vulnerable to this. And the final one says, actually, this surely is going to lead to benefits and uh, improvements. So let's see how we get on with the voting. So this is interesting. Right now, if I'm looking at how people are voting, I don't know if it's a pattern. Most people are worried about other people's jobs more than they're worried about their own job. Uh, I hope uh, you, I think I hope you feel the same by the end of the session. Uh, Laura, can we um, uh, show everyone the results? So there we go. So the good news is two thirds of you think, hey, this is okay. You kind of listen to the standard macro story, the one that I would give in my class, in the end, productivity is what leads to a growth in living standards. Uh, I, I think that's right myself. Uh, a couple of things though, uh, the aggregate hides a lot of mess uh, and also the transition can take a long time. So I, I sympathize with uh, the 22% of you who fear that AI and robotics may lead to mass uh, unemployment problems. Um, and it's interesting how uh, option three, I don't worry about AI and robotics, I think my job is safe, uh, um, uh, it, it, so is a, a, quite a high number compared to other groups I've spoken to. So if we can also now go to the next poll, Laura. So this is one actually about what's happening right now because COVID, as I said earlier, has accelerated, in a previous webinar, has accelerated uh, issues around an aging society and longevity. Um, but it's also accelerated our use of technology. And this lecture, I'm going to talk about how wonderful technology is and how great it's going to be. But you've been using this stuff. Here we are, and as a webinar, uh, doing it. Um, so I'm curious to know, did you think technology is going to replace your job soon? You're a bit shocked what can be done online. Uh, it made you realize what can't be taken uh, off online or just realize actually this stuff is pretty crap in many ways. So I'll just give you time to do your votes. Uh, not surprisingly, given how the previous voting went, um, not many of you feel that technology is soon going to be replacing your job. Um, and the biggest part, the most common response so far is the that you think technology can't replace many of your uh, jobs. Uh, so that's good news. Laura, can you show the results? Uh, and I do sympathize with a third of you who say you realize how poor and limited technology currently is. Uh, it's great Zoom. I can easily talk to many, many people. I, I think I gave a talk to 26,000 people earlier this week, um, but it, it, it's not the same as seeing all your familiar faces and interacting with you 
particularly right at the end when I click the button to end, you just disappear. I can't carry on the conversation with you. So uh, let's uh, now move on. Uh, and by and large, we've got a, a positive group here. Uh, I'm not that surprised because, of course, one of the things we know is that technology likes skilled workers and most of you have high levels of skills or at least high levels of education, um, which economists tend to say is one and the same thing. Uh, but let us move on. So what I want to try and do now is start to sort of test you on some of your beliefs uh, that we just revealed. I want to go through how we think as economists this technology is going to impact the labour market. And I'm going to begin with a standard textbook analysis. And by the way, when you look at these polls of what's going to happen, I, one of my favourite ones is a Pew poll that says 52% of experts when asked think technology will create loss, uh, large loss, job losses and 48% of experts say it won't. So very finely balanced. And my hunch is that the technologists tend to emphasise the job losses because they always exaggerate how quickly jobs will be destroyed and they kind of don't see the jobs that will be created. Uh, and the economists tend to be more optimistic in the long run because, of course, based on history, technology hasn't created mass unemployment. But we'll go through the different channels and different logic and we're going to ask the question, is it different this time? So here's the, the standard economic story, the simple textbook case that goes back over time and says, actually, technology is what makes us have a higher standard of living. So the first thing is technology makes workers more productive. Of course, that means firms want to hire more of them. You know, if the wage is the same and workers are more productive, why would I want fewer workers? I want more of them. So firms try and recruit more workers. But if labour supply is broadly fixed, there aren't more workers to get, then firms will compete amongst themselves for those additional workers and they will drive the wage up. So what you're going to find is employment won't change but the wage is driven up to reflect productivity improvements. And this is a story about the aggregate and the average, but this is why in the end we end up being better off. And another important part of this story is how we respond to higher wages or higher income. In economics, when you've got more money, you want to buy more of everything. And one of the things you want to have more of is leisure. So your labour supply starts to go down. And this is why the average working week today, well, not perhaps today, but in this decade, is less than it was 100 years ago when average working weeks were about 70 hours. So we see over time an increase in GDP, an increase in productivity, an increase in wages, more leisure time, and no unemployment. And that's the standard textbook economic case. Now, Critically, unemployment doesn't rise. There are distributional issues because jobs are destroyed and jobs are created. For instance, you can see the, the, the logo for this part of the talk shows a typewriter. I don't know how many of you still buy typewriters or even use them. Uh, and clearly, you know, jobs in producing typewriters have gone, but jobs in creating computers have come along instead. So there's a lot of churn in the labour market, but not a mass increase in unemployment. And so, you know, that story says we should welcome technology. It's, and by the way, I'm talking purely here about economic issues. I'll touch a little bit on some of the political issues that arise with AI, but this is really about economics. But this is what's behind Keynes's favorite, uh, famous essay in the 1930s, uh, The Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And what he basically said was we're going to be so productive as we get older, uh, as technology increases, that we can meet our needs by working just a few hours. And so the biggest problem we're going to have in society is what to do with all that leisure. I don't know if you feel that's the biggest problem you have right now in your life, uh, but Keynes was sometimes right and sometimes wrong. But this sort of, I've got a picture of George Jetson here. I don't know if anyone recognises George Jetson. This was a Hanna-Barbera cartoon, even before my time, early 60s. Uh, it's a science fiction version of the Flintstones. Uh, and George Jetson worked at Space the Space Sprockets. And his job was actually a remarkably good job title, given that it was invented in the early 60s. He was a digital index operator. Uh, I'm sure many of you yourself may be digital index operators right now. And his job was two hours a week, just turning a button on and off. So this is this version of technology that gives us lots of leisure, a high standard of living, possibly quite dull and boring jobs, but where the machines do everything. Another version of this is the digital Athens, where we've got so much leisure we can focus on being creative and philosophical and thinking about the big issues in life. 
course, there's another version of this story, which is where we have lots of leisure because we're unemployed, because machines are doing everything. And so this is a different version and where people are concerned we may be heading. Now, for that to be true, there has to be something that makes technology different this time. And by the way, here, I'm not talking about transitional issues, I'm talking about long run issues. Well, why might we see mass unemployment and, and machines taking all our jobs when that hasn't happened in the past? So here's a quote from Martin Ford, who a few years ago wrote an excellent book called The Rise of the Robots, that I think just captures this sort of dystopian view of technology. And I understand where that comes from. The threat to overall employment is that as creative destruction unfolds, the destruction will fall primarily on labor intensive businesses in areas like retail and goods preparation. While the jobs being created will occur in industries that simply just don't hire many people. So I've got a picture of uh, Frankenstein here because in the book I refer to this as the sort of Frankenstein syndrome. Both with longer lives and technology, there's this fear that our great human achievements are gonna rise up against us and cause us problems. And of course with AI, that's that we're gonna have such super smart machines that they're just gonna dominate humans. Now there's a lot of debate about that and something called the singularity. I'm not gonna to go to that metaphysical direction. I'm just gonna focus on what does it mean for the labor market and should we really be worried at this time? And as always, there's this concept of exponential growth which you always hear from places like the Singularity University. And I think it's interesting to focus on exponential growth. As an economist, I get a little bit upset with it because Exponential growth just means a constant percentage growth rate. And it could be very slow, it could be very fast. Lots of things show exponential growth. But there is something about rapid exponential growth that seems to characterize these new technologies. And Richard Baldwin talks about uh, four laws. Moore's law, the doubling of computing power every 18 months. Uh, Gilder's law, which is about bandwidth, which doubles every couple of years. Metcalfe's law, which is simply a mathematical rule that sort of basically says that the bigger the network, the more interconnections there are, and it rises at a quadratic rate, so it rises very fast. And then finally, Hal Varian, a distinguished economist, uh, who says we're, we're seeing something because what we're seeing is all these free digital components that you can kind of grab online, at, for instance, trying to create an app. But if you can stitch together the combination that everyone likes, then suddenly you become an instant multimillionaire. So we're seeing an incredibly rapid rate of innovation because there's these freely available components and can quickly be assembled that can make you staggeringly rich almost in an afternoon. Now, what's interesting about these four laws is Moore's law possibly is slowing down. There's a big debate about whether we're reaching the limits of being able to double computing power. But so much of what we're seeing around AI and robotics right now is actually these other three components, particularly Gilders and Metcalfe's law. So driverless cars, do require computers that can process lots of information, but we've got that. But what's really important for driver's cars is about to transmit information and data to guide the car. So that's very much more about Gilder's law. So we're seeing this explosive growth because of the interaction of these four very rapid exponential growth phenomena. So it's happening incredibly quickly. So why might it be different this time? Speed of change. Uh, you know, compared to railway technology or steam technology, this seems very rapid. Secondly, there's, uh, you know, a, a notion that in the labour market, there's a race going on between education and technology. And if you can keep your education above the technology, then you've got a job. Of course, that has issues about inequality, but as long as education keeps ahead of technology, then we're doing fine. But given the speed of change that is happening, how does education keep up with it? And then there also seems something different this time around. Previously machines brought physical power, now they seem to be bringing intellectual power. Now, this is a, you know, we can get very metaphysical here because the phrase artificial intelligence is another one of these beautiful marketing phrases. Because actually, it's not really what I would call intelligence. Most of these machines right now are very good at one thing and they don't really understand a problem there's been a big shift in how we think about computers from sort of thinking about it as a human would, a sort of if then else type approach to really turning everything into prediction problems, whereby the computer just kind of gets lots of data, takes a picture of the world and then says, well, I've seen this before, this will happen. But it's not really intelligence and true sense of understanding something. 
And it does have great predictive power because of the ability to handle these sort of almost photocopies of the world. And you know, that I think is what is bringing about this rapid growth of AI, but of course it may lead to limits in what we think about as understanding, but that ability to turn things into a prediction problem and collapse the gap between data and decision, which is really what things like big data do, of course has huge implications for, for jobs. Now, if we think about this uh, path of technology, uh, Hans Moravec, a Carnegie Mellon uh, professor of computing, very famous uh, influential figure, talks about a landscape of human competence. So think about the water level in this picture as the level of AI's ability to tackle certain problems. And what we're seeing is that water level is rising. And as it rises, certain things that humans used to be best at disappear. So you know, we know that chess and go and poker, uh, machines are taking it over. And, and even driving now, we know machines can do in some sense more safely than humans. And we know that this level of water is going to carry on rising. So there's certain parts of the landscape that will be last to be covered, or perhaps never will be covered. And by the way, it's also, I think, important to stress as an economist that it doesn't matter if a computer can do something better than you, it still may not be cheaper than you. So there may be things that we as humans always have a comparative advantage in. But this is this shifting landscape of human competence with bits of it being swallowed up and jobs disappearing. Now, this leads to the sort of frightening stories uh, about the holy cow moment or the holy shit moment, whatever you want to talk about. Because with this exponential growth, what you see is sort of a diagram um, as we've got here, where you have exponential growth, something is rising very rapidly and eventually it starts to level off. But during here, it's showing constant growth of 20%, 20%, 20%. But you hear about all these machines getting better and better because they're getting 20% better, but you don't really notice them because it's 20% of a small number. But eventually the number gets bigger and bigger because of that 20%, and suddenly you get this holy cow moment where suddenly life is transformed. As, as humans, we tend to think linearly, the claim is, we sort of project forward what we've seen in the past. But then eventually these huge proportional jumps go, wow, when did machines get capable of doing that? And yeah, I know there's a lot of former students of mine listening, but I always talk about the second half of the chessboard story. There's a, a fable about uh, uh, the invention of chess where uh, the Indian mathematician who invents the game of chess is asked what he'd like as a prize. And he says, I'd like one grain of rice on the first square, two grains of rice on the second, four grains on the third, eight on the fourth, every square is getting doubled. That doesn't sound like many grains of rice, but if you add up what it means in terms of the whole chessboard, it's 18 quintillion grains of rice. In the first half of the chessboard, when you're doubling every uh, square, the number of grains, you're going from 64 to 120, it doesn't seem great. But in the second half of the chessboard, you're going from 64 billion to 128 billion. Those are big increases. And this Moore's law of doubling every 18 months, just think what that means. It means that in the next three years, computing power will increase fourfold. So what you're gonna see in the next three years is four times everything we've ever seen. So from nothing to driverless cars, we should see that times four in the next three years. So in the second half of the chessboard, suddenly it's 20% of very big numbers or it's doubling of very big numbers and we're not prepared for it. So the sort of singularity story, the exponential story is we under, we, you know, we say, well, it hasn't made any difference yet. Sure, it's doubling every 18 months, but look, it's not doing anything. And then suddenly it reaches a level where, wham, it comes in. Now, I've been telling that story about, you know, uh, uh, computing power doubling uh, um, four times in the next three years for at least the last 10 years, and, and we still haven't got many driverless cars on the streets. So it's clearly not just about technological power, but the logic is there at some point, if this growth continues, there will be this holy cow moment. And before then, we'll be underestimating the risks and then suddenly it happens. So let me try and just think a little bit more structured about how all this actually affects employment and jobs. And I'm gonna try and do two things. I'm gonna look at what the impact will be on the number of jobs and then think about what it means in terms of the type of jobs. And here I'm borrowing a framework of Darren Asimoglu and Pascal Restrepo, uh, and it has three channels. 
One is there's a displacement effect. Machines automate certain tasks, and in doing so, they eliminate jobs. So uh, one of the jobs that has disappeared over the last 60 years is elevator operator. We used to have people who used to control the elevator. That job is gone because machines can now automate that task. However, there's a positive effect on all this, which I mentioned earlier, which is if machines make workers more productive, then I want more of them. And particularly, they're going to start to go into the jobs that can't be easily automated. So we have a displacement effect. Technology gets rid of jobs. We have a productivity effect. It creates jobs. And in writing the book, one of the interesting case studies I came across was the invention of VisiCalc, the world's, world's first digital spreadsheet. And it's pretty obvious, but I never really thought about it. A spreadsheet literally used to be that. It was a large sheet you would spread on the table and it would have rows and columns and you'd do different calculations. Of course, once VisiCalc came along, you didn't need all those book clerks to keep recalculating the spreadsheets. You could just press a button and it would do it. Beforehand, if you wanted to change a strategy and say run through a 3% growth forecast, there would have to be a book clerk who would have to go away and change all the cells, make sure it added up. It would take time. But with the arrival of spreadsheets in the United States, 400,000 book clerks lost their job, displacement. Now, one of the things I always ask my students is, what's happened to the size of your finance department since spreadsheets have come along? And of course, they haven't got smaller. What now means is it's so easy to do calculations that we ask for more and more calculations and more and more strategies. So that's kind of the productivity effect. You shift away from the task that can be automated just doing the calculation, and you shift to the thing that is not so easy to be automated, the analysis. And in this case, you saw a growth of 600,000 accountants, 400,000 fewer book clerks, 600,000 more accountants, and presumably some of the book clerks retrained as a accountants. Similarly, when ATMs were introduced in banks, you'd have thought ATMs would lead to a reduction in the number of bank cashiers at a bank. It didn't, because now those cashiers could do more high value added tasks than just hand out cash. So you get this shift from displacement to productivity. It's going to vary between different industries, but one's negative and one's positive. Then the one I think you can see you can see that negative and positive why we might not know how unemployment's going to go because it depends on the relative magnitude of those two forces. But the thing that is really important and is probably the hardest one to think about is what I call the creative effect. Because with all this happening with an increase in wages that we talked about earlier, you get new jobs being created. And some of those jobs are just almost impossible to foresee. If you think about the job titles that many people have got now, you just wouldn't have imagined it. I I'm, you know, find Twitter extraordinary. Who'd have thought that uh, a, a product based on 280 characters would suddenly create a multi-million, probably multi-billion industry and supporting thousands of jobs and taking up a lot of time? That is just not something you could have foreseen. So this creative effect, the new jobs, the new roles that come, is one that is hardest to sign. I think makes it hardest to then say definitively, will AI and robotics lead to higher or lower unemployment? What I think all this is getting to is that actually you probably don't want to look at the aggregate level of unemployment. You want to think about the churn in the labor market. So here we've got a chart showing the United States employment going back to 1850 across different sectors. And you kind of know what this shows, that big green area there is agriculture. So we've seen the share of agriculture massively shrink, and we've seen other sectors just grow, health, education, uh, transportation, just massive growth. So of course, what was happening in agriculture because it became so productive was the displacement effect dominated the productive effect. You just didn't need so many people working on the farms. So it was a big fall in employment and agriculture, but people moved into other sectors, into the factories, creating whole new jobs and whole new career paths. And then, of course, moving into the city then required a whole host of other jobs that needed to support them. So this is this picture of churn. So unemployment is only one part of the issue we're looking at. We certainly need to worry about that. But there's also this churn in the labour market. So that then says, let's look at different types of jobs, because now we're going to come down to what sort of skills people are going to need in the future. 
And in economics, we are use this two by two chart to try and understand that is. So what I want you to do is to think of every job as being made up of many tasks. So I gave the example earlier of an elevator operator. The trouble with that job, it only had one task, which was to take the elevator garage up and down. There's not many other things you can do. But most jobs have a number of tasks involved in them. So I think about my job as a professor, I'm there to do research, I'm there to, to lecture, I'm there to grade, and there's always meetings that seem to be requiring my attendance. So I've got lots of different tasks, and not all of them are gonna be subject to automation. So what's gonna happen is some jobs will see tasks automated, but the tasks that can't be automated would expand to take up more of the job. So then the question is, what are the jobs that will be automated or what are the tasks that will be automated? And this two by two grid, which is quite standard now, says, okay, let's think about two dimensions. One is, are the tasks routine or non-routine? There's obviously a certain ambiguity there, but routine means, you know, can I write down a, a series of instructions and give them to you so you can perform the task without really having to make any judgments? Then there's sort of, is it an, an analytical task or is it a non-analytical task? There's various euphemisms used here. Is this sort of uh, intellectual versus manual? I mean, it, it, but it's sort of um, to do with uh, um, human intelligence, uh, mental intelligence, uh, and then more physical tasks. I'll come back to that later, because I think that misses something. But what we've seen so far with automation is a lot of routine, non-analytical tasks disappearing. And of course, the elevator operator is one of those. But things like back office processing, uh, increasingly I'm finding, so automatic call centers will use uh, robotics to try and guide you. Uh, a lot of those jobs are disappearing. But as I was describing earlier with the sort of uh, the quartet of laws, we're also beginning to see a lot of analytical routine jobs disappear. And what's interesting about those jobs is there's a lot of middle class jobs there. It's quite well income, high educated ones. And those analytical and routine jobs can be picked up by this predictive, this ability of AI to turn things into a prediction problem. So marketing issues, for instance, we just know that you know, the gap between data and decision-making is what AI and robotics deals with. Um, there's lots and lots of accounting tasks and legal tasks that require an analytical perspective, but a, a routine. So we're seeing more and more of these jobs disappear. And as the in, in, uh, intellectual power machines get greater, there's gonna be more of those under threat. Then there's the non-analytical, non-routine. In some ways, driverless cars, driverless trucks is an example of that. Because driving a car is not a routine process. There's loads of different things you have to calculate and decide. But we're seeing, because of the exponential growth in the underlying technology, those jobs being under threat. So uh, would it be drones, would it be driverless cars? But there's a whole bunch of those physical but non-routine jobs that will disappear. Um, I think it's important though to stress there's a whole bunch in this box that won't disappear. And that goes back to what is really gonna be where jobs go to, which is those that involve very human skills. And one of the most non-analytical, non-routine skills is understanding people, just empathy. And with an aging population, you're gonna need carers more and more, but this is gonna be an area where there's gonna be a lot of growth. And I do think it's important to stress that group because uh, in general, the technology story says, wow, you know, there's going to be an even bigger divide between those with education and skills uh, who can carry on getting jobs and those without. But if human skills aren't just about analytical skills, but just empathy and compassion, then there's you know, a, a very different way of measuring skills here. You know, I'm a faculty member and I'm very aware when I go to a faculty meeting, there may be a lot of analytical skills in the room, but the sort of emotional skills may not be there. So this is a sort of, I think, a really interesting one, which has relevance for education, but also how we think about measuring skills. Um, but then what we have got is the box that is hardest, if you go back to Moravec's map of human competence. This is the peak which is hardest for AI to reach, which is analytical and non-routine. And that's the sort of the decision-making under uncertainty, dealing with issues of ambiguity, or just sheer creativity. Um, now, there's a big debate in AI about even whether that can be uh, uh, invaded by uh, machines. 
but there's something about setting up a hypothesis, testing it, rejecting it, advancing it, shifting it around, that is a very human skill and blending together lots and lots of different stimuli to do so. And those type of roles in jobs, the sort of the real, what Andrew Lickman and the uh, former Dean London Business School called judgment, is different from the prediction problems that AI is very, very good at. So there's a core set of skills that humans are good at, but what you're going to see already is more and more non-analytical routine tasks disappear. Increasing numbers of analytical routine tasks disappear. So for me, I would say that's hopefully grading. Uh, I don't want to upset any former students, but grading is some analytical and routine, uh, but could be done by AI. But then there's a lot of other stuff like real human interaction around teaching that is harder for machines to take over. So this is the framework we think about how technology will affect people. So then the question is, okay, if every job is made up of different tasks, how many jobs are vulnerable to automation? So this is uh, an OECD study. And very few jobs are made up of tasks that are fully automable. Um, but around 60% of jobs have at least 30% of their activities automable. So, you know, that's a lot of people in the labor market where about two thirds of their job is not automatable, but one third is. But there's gonna be job losses in that group because the non-automable tasks will expand, but not for everyone. So of course, what you're gonna see in that role is a sort of upskilling or a shift in the task. So the question people have to ask themselves is, am I someone in this firm who's gonna be shifting into those non-automable tasks or do i have a disadvantage in terms of skills or background or ability that mean i'm likely to be one of the people who lose my jobs because automation starts to come in now um there's lots of barriers to automation but what i'd like to try and do is having done this sort of high level analysis come back down to your own roles and laura perhaps if you can launch poll three and i want to just try and think of you and your own role and again, there's multiple choices here. But to what extent do you think the job that you do is made up of mainly non-routine tasks, so it'll be hard to automate? Or within the job I've got, I think what will happen is I'll shift into those higher value added tasks, like you know, the accountant rather than the book clerk. Or I'm fine because I've got all sorts of regulations and barriers uh, protecting me, uh, professional bodies or whatever it might be. Um, uh, I'm fine for now because AI is going to just ages to before it comes uh, uh, cost effective or, oh dear, I've got a bit of a problem. So let's see how we're uh, doing here. Uh, just let the votes carry on. So, uh, okay, uh, so Laura, if we can show the results, uh, uh, it's interesting how uh, concentrated the responses are. Uh, roughly two thirds of you think your job is made up of mainly non-routine tasks. I, I hope that's right. I, I think you may be underestimating the ability of AI, but uh, it depends on time scale. And a third of you roughly feel that you can upshift. Uh, again, remember though, that there'll be a certain sort of zero sum game within corporations. Not everyone within that corporation will get the up, uh, upskilled uh, jobs. So there will be some reskilling around. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, so uh, let's close that poll. So let me try and summarize what we've got. Uh, despite history showing that technology boosts employment, what happens this time around? It's ambiguous. I hate to give you the economic story of on the one hand or on the other, but that's how technology works. It's reassuring to look at history, but it could be different this time. If you look at most estimates of the number of jobs of risk of being replaced, the OECD, I think, do the most careful analysis, and they say 14% of jobs are at risk. But I think that's, again, to miss one of the points. That says there's 86% of jobs which will change. They may not disappear, but they're going to change. So there's a huge role for upskilling and learning, because even if a job stays the same, it's going to shift what you do and how you do it. The other thing, although perhaps not reflected in this group, is that the anxiety about losing a job will be much greater than the number of people actually do. Now, I'm not sure that's a good or a bad thing, but there will be a tension and anxiety about this automation. The other thing, which is a social point, which is one about industrial revolution, about Engels' pause, it's about the dynamics of this change. When the industrial revolution happened, and I can show you this in the next chart, 
what you get is economic progress, productivity, GDP per workers increasing. But wages didn't. For the first half of the Industrial Revolution, wages didn't change. The share of labour income in GDP started to decline. And by the way, that's what it's been doing the last 10 or 15 years in most countries. It was only later, with trade unions and making sure that firms invested in technology in a way that benefited workers, that you started to see the increase in wage. So it's not just, will I lose my job? It's not just, will I have to reskill to do something different and keeping my job? It's also, will I see the benefits of this game? Will my wages carry on rising? Now, you know, this is a very complicated story with lots of different sectors and different skill levels, but this is not just about unemployment technology. It's about a lot more. So let me just come back to what I think is a really, really important issue here. Uh, and I said technology is not destiny. If you go through this analysis I've covered so far, we know that there's three effects. There's a productivity effect, which boosts employment. There's a creative effect, creating new jobs. And there's a negative effect, which is displacement. So what we're going to make sure as a society and as a government is that the productive and creative channels dominate the displacement one. And so I want to draw a distinction between automation and augmentation. If firms introduce technology in a form of automation, which is just displacing jobs, then we're going to see a big increase in unemployment. If, however, we can use technology to augment jobs to make workers more productive, then that's going to be great and we get the good positive outcome. But this isn't just something we can leave to chance. This is about what type of technology we're producing and who is using it and how they're using it. And you know, if you look at who's creating the AI at the moment, it's AI firms who aren't really thinking about augmentation or they're probably thinking more about the technology itself. And firms are going to have a big incentive to use it right now to cut costs. And cut costs is not about augmenting the productivity of a worker. It's about replacing them with a technology that may not even be good. It just may be cheap. So we really urgently got to make sure that firms have got an incentive to augment productivity. So what do I mean by that? Well, if I take the case of, say, teaching, there's loads of stuff that AI can provide in terms of providing information and testing students. But the real value then is going to come is from that human contact between the teacher and the student, not to sort of check why they're, what they've learned, but why they're learning, what they want to do, and to keep them on track. That has enormous value in the education sector, similarly in the health sector. And I pick up health and education because these are two huge employers that are going to be affected by productivity from AI. We've got to make sure that we don't give firms an incentive to get rid of jobs but instead to work with the individuals there and improve the quality of the product people get, as well as raising the productivity of those working. In other words, augmentation is about producing good jobs and a human-friendly technology. Um, what, about, what are the incentives that firms have got? Here's a, a study from the US. And actually, firms have got a big incentive to spend money on capital, not to augment workforce because all the write downs of investing in AI are quite substantial. So we've got to make sure we have a tax system that doesn't focus on automation, but produces augmentation. Now, a lot on technology, and I, I, you know, my heartland is longevity, so let me come on to this. Uh, as you know, uh, life expectancy has been increasing in the broad span of time. Uh, we don't yet know the impact of COVID, but I think still over time, we'll see life expectancy increase in the long run. And according to the UK government, uh, a, a child born, a female child born in the UK today should live somewhere between 95 and 107 years long. Wow. And we know that one of the consequences of those long lives is people working for longer. So here we've seen the last 10 years, for instance, most of the increase in employment that we've seen in the, some major economies has come from people aged over 55 still working. So longer lives and longer careers. But I just painted this picture of a labor market that's gonna come under a lot of flux and shift and change. And even if you don't lose your job, what your job involves and how you do it is going to change. So you can see how these two are gonna to blend together. Now, one of the reasons for writing The New Long Life was when I presented The 100 Year Life, people said, but if you can work for longer, where do the jobs come from? And I've already dealt with that a little bit. They're gonna be based around human skills, 
But we don't need to be too despondent because in some sense, actually it's good we've got robots coming along because as well as people living for longer, we're seeing the population shrink. So in China, there's gonna be a fall of 300 million people in the size of the population. We need robots to come along and take over some of the jobs that people used to do. The other thing that's important to, to understand is that we can have older people working, it doesn't mean there's fewer jobs for younger people. There isn't a, a lump of output to be produced. Just as over the 20th century, we saw a huge increase in the number of females working, and that didn't come at the cost of male unemployment, so we can get a big increase in the number of older people working without a big decrease in employment of younger people. But of course, you've got different skills and different roles, so what will those jobs be later on? Now, as I say, the Industrial Revolution really cemented a three-stage life of education, work, and retirement, and you can see that longevity and technology are blowing this up. Because if you're gonna live longer, you need to work for longer. We can't retire at 65 and, uh, uh, and finance a decent consumption level. So you're gonna to have to work for longer. Now, of course, working for longer also is gonna require more skills and relearning given the technology changes that are happening. And also if you think about that education at the first stage of life, given that length of career and the disruptions that are likely to happen in terms of upskilling and reskilling, you're gonna to have to spread education right the way through. So technology and longevity together are just disrupting the three-stage life, confirming a more multi-stage life, more transitions and more stages. So, you know, the theme of the new long life is how do we seize the opportunities of technology and longevity? But really kind of what's happened, the book of life and the book of work has got longer, but the chapters have got shorter because of this churn that's gonna be happening in the labor market. So what does that mean for you? Uh, and, and metaphorical you of course well as i said your career is going to be a longer one if you're living to 100 you're probably going to have to start work carry on working to your early 70s for instance so it's going to be a longer career there will be more transitions more stages and more leisure so where does the leisure come in well obviously as life gets longer we don't spend all our time working so some of it will be work and some of it will be leisure but it's going to be distributed in different ways, some of it more at the beginning, perhaps less of it at the end as we work for longer, but there'll be other breaks in the middle. And of course, this also fits in with the notion that as technology comes along, we will eventually perhaps see a shift to a four day working week or whatever. Now that then raises a very big issue for you as a person, because do you respond to these transitions by just reacting when they happen or instigating them before they do? So, you know, do you think, that your job can carry on in its current form, or your employer can, or should you look to do something different with new skills, or do you think you'll carry on finding your current job not just doable, but enjoyable? So should I change? But I think the other thing that's kind of important here to stress is what I call here is cycles, because that three-stage life with the notion of a career was based around jobs. And sometimes you will be still doing a job. And by a job, I mean turning up with an employer who pays you a wage to perform a number of tasks. But we are seeing with this technology, the rise of task-based work and the gig economy is an example of that. So sometimes you'll be in a job where you have a job title and you have a relationship with a firm. Other times you may be much more focused on just delivering certain tasks, either as a gig work or even perhaps as part of the firm. Then, of course, linked to that is the notion, is, is my job a stable one or is it contingent? As in, I've got a phone call today, there's work to be done, or I've got a project, I'm busy for the next couple of months. And then one that, of course, we're very aware of today is sometimes you'll be working on site and the premises of a company, other times off site. And obviously, with these longer careers and multiple stages, you're probably going to go through cycles of different combinations of these. Sometimes it might be a stable job on site, other times stable job off site, but there'd be lots of different combinations here that you will cycle through. Sometimes that'd be great because you'll say, well, you know, I, I'm 60, I wanna carry on working, but I wanna do something different. I don't wanna be on the, uh, on the site, this works for me. Other times it could be not working so well, but it's a way of keeping busy and earning money whilst you try and get back into a, a stable job. But life's gonna get a lot more complicated and this has a really important issue about navigation and also your sense of identity. Because, of course, with a 
industrial revolution, your job was a big part of your identity. That second stage defined you and your career and possibly even your employer. But we're going to see a lot more cycling. And so how you frame your identity is going to be important. And we talked in The 100 Year Life about the importance of transformational assets and dealing with that flux. But how you see yourself as separate from a job or separate from an employer and how you link together these different stages is going to be a really, really important part of your well-being. And the other thing that's important in terms of navigating this is, of course, if there's over this longer working career, I, I will talk later about reskilling and upskilling. But over our life, there's never one period where we're good at everything. There's always a time when some skills are getting better and other skills are atrophying. So then the question is, OK, when I get older, these are the things I want to do and these are what my skills are. What role do I want then? So how do you navigate through? But that then leads to this last line here, which I think is really important. With all of this, there's a greater responsibility thrust on you as an individual. Your career promotion, your career progression, the skills, possibly even your health, is much more about your responsibility than created by an employer. Now, maybe something you're fully aware of, but it's going to get even greater as we go forward. And that's a challenge, of course, because those with resources can deal with that responsibility better than those without resources. So this is where the whole welfare state system also needs to be reconsidered. But it also comes back to a much broader sense of what we mean by work. With the Industrial Revolution, work became something we did at a place of work for money. And actually, that's quite a narrow sense of work compared to work traditionally as a phrase. There will be a lot of what you'll be doing in your career now, which is work related, but isn't involved with getting a paycheck. It may be uh, networking for the next job. It may be about taking a course to get your new skills, but it will be something you do outside of your contracted time, but is work related. And I think that goes back to the Industrial Revolution and this distinction between a work life balance. It's not that's going to get very, very blurred because of this responsibility you have to carry on investing in your future working self. There's a massive corporate agenda here, and we can't expect corporates to do it out of goodwill. Some will because it's good for them, but we're going to have to see social norms and legislation push them. Right at the heart has to be that we don't let automation happen, but we have augmentation occur. Uh, I really worry, as a consequence of COVID, firms are going to be cutting costs by introducing pretty crappy technology and getting rid of workers. We've got to make sure that doesn't happen. But in terms of supporting these multi-stage lives, as we go through in the book, we have to allow for multiple points of entry, so it's not just the graduate recruitment that matters, but people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s can come in in a role. We have to offer the ability to ramp up and ramp down our work commitments to deal with the need to retrain or the, the need to look after others. To refashion retirement, which is already beginning to happen, but needs to be uh, much stronger. To have workplace practices that support both careers and caring, whether that be for uh, um, children or for elderly parents. I think the whole notion of parental leave will be transformed as we have an aging society and people will take parental leave to look after their parents rather than their, their, their children. Now, what I think is interesting about all this is that firms will be having employees still as well as using gig economy workers more. But this is like a new type of corporate pension. Pensions were introduced in the 20th century as a recruitment and a retention tool. I'll offer you a future pension. I can pay you less, but it builds up the longer you stay here. But in a way, all of this is sort of like extending the corporate pension away from just a financial consideration. Because this multi-stage life that I've talked about, you will require time off to just recharge or to look after children or parents or to pick up new skills. And so rather than think about investing in your future self, just about a pile of money, which is what a three stage life required you to do in your second stage, this multi-stage life, you need to think about investing in lots of assets. And so we can rethink a corporate pension where we have more flexible working practices in order to do this. I'm very conscious of, of times. Let me just turn, briefly talk about education, which I think needs to be transformed. We need more education because there's a race going on with technology, but it has to be more spread out over life. And just as longer life isn't just about end of life, but all of life, if we're having more education throughout life, that changes what we learn at the beginning. We have to focus much more upon learning to learn 
as well as unlearning rather than learning specific things. There's a natural uh, tendency to think about technology and jobs as requiring an education in STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, maths. And I kind of get that, but actually I, I think that's a mistake. First, there's plenty of evidence that actually STEM skills quickly become uh, out of date and need to be relearned again. But really the key scientific skill that we need is a pretty basic one, which is that one I said earlier about forming a hypothesis, testing it, adjusting it, and getting information, and then moving forward. And really, it's human skills that are going to be important. As machines become more machine-like, we have to become more human-like. Uh, and that's not to denigrate STEM skills, they're obviously important, but actually the evidence suggests that STEM skills alone is not a great long-term plan career-wise. Soft skills therefore become much more important, but this is really about adult education. And that's completely different from education at 21 and below. Adults, they're in a different place when they have to learn. So this is a massive change. We'll see new products and new providers, but also it's a massive business opportunity, whether it be for universities or for firms, because of course the number of people aged 21 plus is a lot larger than the number of people aged less than 21. So this will be a, a sea change in our education sector. Governments have an enormous role to play in all of this. And one of them is, much as I love GDP as an economist, moving away from GDP. Because some of the things I've been talking about are about anxiety, it's about human development. Uh, it, it's not about whether we're still producing GDP. We also got to make sure that the technology agenda is not driven by AI companies but is driven by what we want to achieve and augmentation will be one part of that. But we've got to make sure that we don't confuse technological achievement with technological progress. This stuff has to work for us. So we need a debate. We need the equivalent of trade unions and labor movements to start articulating a narrative that works for us. Um, I focus a lot about upskilling and reskilling. And of course I'm going to do that because that's really important at an individual level, but we can't expect everyone to develop skills for these new jobs. We also need governments, to create jobs for existing skills. And actually that's gonna be about quite local, smaller scale entrepreneurship, which will be an important part of keeping people in jobs and creating a sense of community. And then I haven't said much about the political consequences of AI, but they are disturbing. Um, but really what we need for a healthy society are two components. Everyone feels they're getting some benefits from the economic progress and everyone's feeling they've got a voice in the political process that's happened. And that ultimately has to be what governments achieve. If the economic gains are spread too thinly amongst a few, going back to the Martin Ford quote, then we do not have a healthy economy and a healthy society. And how do we ensure that we get technology that benefits everyone? Well, it is about vocalizing civil society. It might be protests in the streets. It's making sure that we are listening to everyone's voice in bringing about this change. The Industrial Revolution came in two stages. The first stage was good for business, was good for GDP, wasn't great for people. Then we got social reform and it started to get better for people. We need to make sure that we don't have two halves to this next Industrial Revolution and that we seize the opportunity to make it more about being better humans if machines are going to be better machines. So that, that of course, is where um, the, uh, uh, the New Long Life comes in, which you hear is the plug for the book. Let me finish with just one more poll. And uh, forgive me if uh, I've been uh, a little bit more negative than some of your positive polls, but I'd be very interested to know what your views are now here at the end. So this is about, again, multiple options are available. Uh, are you thinking about upskilling for your future given what's happening with technology? That's increasing the skills you've got in the current dimension. Are you thinking about reskilling? So that's about actually learning something different for a different role, either because technology or you're bored in your current role, and this is about longevity. And thirdly, uh, I think my government is already on top of this. And if you're in Singapore, you'll probably say yes. In other countries, you might not. And then fourthly, the extent to which you think your own firm or organization is prepared for these uh, changes. So I just let everyone have a chance to vote. Okay, Laura, so if you can perhaps uh, uh, show those results. Um, so uh, most people don't think their government's ready for it. Most people don't think their firms are ready for it. 
and most of you are thinking about reskilling, uh, either because it's a long life and you want to do something different or because technology is going to require you to do that. Uh, and a lot of you are talking about upskilling. I guess that goes back to my punchline, wow, adult education, what a marketplace. Because uh, this is what everyone is going to have to be doing and thinking. And how we achieve it at scale is going to be crucial for our success. Um, I'm very aware of time. I perfectly timed my talk to last an hour. Uh, I know there's a few questions. Uh, I, I totally understand if everyone leaves, but I will just spend a few minutes just answering some of those questions. Um, thank you, those of you who have to go. This was scheduled for an hour, but I'll just run for about five minutes picking up some of the questions, Laura. All right, Andrew. So here's a question. How can we encourage employers to actively recruit older, experienced talent? And another uh, idea on that yeah. is many corporations have to report or have to report things like gender and ethnicity. Is that a direction maybe we should move on in having corporations report age? So I, 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 I've seen that suggestion a lot. And of course, yeah, my trouble here is, first of all, I want, I want to sort of say that age is uh, a diverse statistic. People age very differently. Uh, and secondly, we should just treat people as people. Uh, and so, you know, we, we need to be careful uh, quite how we target things. But yes, you've got to give people incentive uh, and that will be one way. So it's going to be a push and pull. There'll be legislation that will uh, encourage and prevent age discrimination. Um, of course, the optimal thing to do is to get firms to understand the commercial advantages here. And let me just, you know, and the market will go more slowly. So you need to have government regulation. I'm reluctant to talk about age-based stereotypes because what I find with those who support uh, an agenda supportive of aging society, they want to grab hold of all the positive stereotypes that get rid of the negative stereotypes. And I, that's a little bit unfair. However, if you do look at how skills change over time, it does appear that older workers are very good at, as it were, putting their ego less and doing more team management um, and just better at the sort of the, the human skills. And of course, if you go back to what is driving AI and robotics, that's where the jobs are going to be going. So you've got an older consumer base, which will be better understood by older uh, workers, but also you've got AI, which will actually be encouraging demand for those very human skills that uh, people often point to amongst older workers. So you know, there is already something happening out there. Uh, there clearly is huge amounts of ageism. I think corporates uh, uh, are behind the curve here, but also you will find a lot of the older workers going into that gig economy, uh, the contingent economy. Um, and you know, that'll be the short term stop until we start to see uh, more adjustment. All right, great. And here's another question about AI immune jobs, which are a large degree incorporate human elements such as caring and creativity but these also tend to be the lowest paid. How will this play out in the future? Yes, and of course, you know, I mean, this is where I get very complicated. So you often see caring jobs being called as load skill, which I, I think is a very unfortunate way to refer to them. I mean, as an economist, I talk about demand and supply. And of course, if many people are capable of doing a job, then you're gonna see that being low wage. Um, and, you know, that, that's going to be then driving forward what's going to happen to wages. Um, it depends what we mean by caring. Um, and clearly a lot of our caring industry is not a high benchmark for caring. Just look what's happened in the care homes in the UK. So I think, I think that'll be the, the, the trick. You're still going to have uh, um, some jobs that require exceptional skills that not many people have, and they will be very richly rewarded. Um, so that'll still be the, the differentiation. Um, and the distribution of human skills is, um, particularly caring skills, is different from the distribution of computational skills, but it's still not something everyone has to the same degree. So people who are good at the things that are most valuable will still do very well. Um, and, and it'll be a shift in what we see as being scarce with technology that will matter. Great. And how can this model work for all of the population, especially with continually upskilling and unstable employment? How will this work for everyone? 
Yeah. So, I, I mean, the, we need to rethink our social welfare system for sure, because traditionally with the Industrial Revolution, you were poor if you didn't have a job. Now you're poor because you've got a job that's low paid and doesn't guarantee you many hours. And we're struggling with what to do with that. And as I say, adult education, I think, is absolutely crucial. But our adult education is done disproportionately by those who already have large amounts of education. So how do we provide cheap at scale education for everyone? And there, I think online has a huge role to play. And there are various tax incentives that you can provide. Uh, I think you could start to see corporates coming together and working collectively to make sure that the gig economy is providing them with the skills that they need. So you're gonna see something a bit like what you saw with industrial revolution, we saw much more regional focus of employers and councils coming together to provide it. So that would be um, one way of doing it. Uh, the other thing is a universal basic income. But um, as I say, for me, the universal basic income is, you know, it has its problems and has its advantages. But the most important thing is to have people be engaged. And I think a job is very important for that, which comes back to making sure that we give employers incentives not to automate, but to augment. That to me seems crucial here. Great, and could you also comment on the enabling effect technology allows, the ability to hire workers for less in other countries? Right, so that's, uh, so, so one of the uh, challenges, uh, so, <laughs> so we're seeing a lot of interesting shifts. So, Previously, manufacturing has tended to outsource production to low-income countries because low-income countries have lots of people. Now, of course, with AI and robotics, what you're seeing is onshoring occurring again because robots are like people, and so you're seeing the rich countries resource manufacturing. But the service sector, you're now, of course, seeing uh, around the world this you know, very educated workforce scattered around who can provide service sector activities remotely. I mean because of COVID, we're all providing these type of services online. And therefore, low wage countries with high education will be able to provide these services. Uh, so you'd be a, a service sector offshore, offshoring rather than a manufacturing offshoring. Um, so yeah, and that's one of the issues we're gonna see with globalization of service sector. We're gonna see less globalization in manufacturing because of tariffs, but it'll be interesting what happens in the service sector. Wonderful. And here's another question on the multi-stage live. Um, how do things like the 30-year mortgage fit into the multi-stage life? Do you think it's going to change? Yes, I, I think there'd be all sorts of changes in the financial sector. I mean, our pensions and mortgages were created around a three-stage life, and we haven't got that anymore. So we will see changes. You already see some sort of intergenerational uh, mortgages. Um, I think, you know, I think there's, uh, you're going to see two trends. One is we saw a life insurance industry develop in the 20th century to sort of ensure you if you died early to make sure your financial affairs were in order. As we're living longer, longevity insurance is going to become incredibly important, which is reducing the risk of outliving your assets or outliving a sense of purpose. And, you know, health is a great form of life insurance, but education and relationships are a great form of longevity insurance but there'll be a big financial industry about these two and then i think you will see as life lengthens of course you know wealth accumulates so older people will get wealthier compared to those at the beginning and of course remember if you're living longer you're going to have to consume less at the beginning because you've got to make your assets last longer so we'll start to see financial assets that try and work within the family to spread assets around. So I think that'll be some of the mortgage products we'll start to see. Um, I think, but leave it at that. I can see there's loads more questions, but thank you very much for your time. Uh, and the webinar and the slides will be available on the website later. Thank you, Laura, and thank you everyone for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.